It's showtime on Saturday, our sixth episode, I do believe, Ryan Wilton. Good morning to you. Good morning. It's hard to believe, man. Sixth episode, and it sort of it, it concludes our spring semester, if you will. That's right. Summer vacation for this. It is, uh, it is Beyond the Bell, brought to you by uh, the good folks at Every Kid Counts Oklahoma, who are sponsoring this series on innovation. It's been amazing to me. We've no politics, all innovation. I've, I've enjoyed the way that you've set this up. It's been tremendous. We've talked about innovation all across the board. Uh, I think schools, you, private I think, schools. I think you put it best uh, week one or week two. We're in the learning business. Um, you know, learning a little bit more about all these different educational niches and what makes each one of these schools and innovators unique. Yeah. And it's, you know, sometimes the headlines, uh, boast, uh, well, they really focus on the politics. Mm -hmm. and that's what's been fun about this one is to go to a different place, you know, and in a digital form where that actually nobody else is. And this is because of Ryan Welton and the innovations at Griffin. Okay. So over the years, oh, in the course of COVID too, right, buddy? A hundred percent, but really, uh, uh, without the, the support, uh, from the, from Griffin communications, uh, none of this is, is possible. They're, they're letting us stretch our wings, spread our wings, if you will, and try new things in the public affairs space on digital. And I'm happy to, to cooperate with that and to work with, uh, Griffin on this because, you know, for Mitchell talks has been a couple of years. We've been working on this, which really the way we're doing things happened because of COVID and everybody going remote and uh, we're still there. So here's a fun fact, 32,000, um, well, it's, I guess it's, we've got 32 schools, charter schools. We've got 60,000 students in Oklahoma in those charter schools. And one of the interesting aspects of what we're going to talk about today is at risk students and how that they work and the niches that you can, can do in terms of innovation and tailoring to the needs of students. And it's a issue that in the politics gets people all fired up. We're going to talk about the innovation aspect. Got some great guests this morning. Let me introduce them to you. First off, we have Dean Ketchum, who's the head of schools at uh, John Rex charter and uh, Dean, how are you? Uh, I'm, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. It's tricky whenever that you go into a three shot, and you get half of your head. Yeah. And whichever way you go, it's the opposite way. Okay. Yeah, we're glad to have you. Thank you. Okay. Also, we, we worked really hard to make sure that Loida Salmond's name was pronounced correctly. Did I do that right, Loida? I think you're on mute right now. Sorry about that. Yes, you did great. Outstanding. I'm glad we did that. And Loida is with the, uh, she's the board, the board president of Lamond international. Did I say Lamond correctly? Yes, you did. Okay. So language, uh, uh, immersive program, which I'm hoping we can work. We'll work a little on our French and Spanish before we get out of here. It's good to have you Loida. Thank you. It's nice to be here. And also Melissa white with the Oklahoma, she's the, um, Oklahoma, the director of education for Oklahoma youth Academy. And, uh, it's good to see you, Melissa. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Okay. So great panel. Uh, we hope you enjoy this discussion right here. We have got, uh, an hour to get down to exactly what they do. Ryan, take it away. Uh, you bet. Thank you, Scott. Um, I, I thought before we uh, go around the horn, uh, maybe if somebody could, uh, let's just pretend that nobody knows what a charter school is exactly and how it's different from a pub, you know, from a traditional public school and how it's different from a private school. So who can, who can explain exactly what a charter school is and, and how it works in the state of Oklahoma? I can give you my take on it uh, after being at several kinds of schools around. Certainly we are a public school and we offer a different viewpoint to parents. And um, for my school, you know, I have a catchment zone. So if you choose to come here, we take students that are in our tier one area and then other students who are interested living in the Oklahoma City area um, with, you know, the way that we're set up would um, apply through a lottery. But um, it's just a choice outside their neighborhood or within their neighborhood that um, because of uh, your philosophy, your relationships, uh, where your location is, might be a viable option for those students uh, either living in the neighborhood or beyond. 
right. So, but, but uh, a charter school, it, it, it is a public school, as you said, uh, but they just uh, work to uh, a niche audience and do different things. For example, Loida, it's, it's an immersive language program in your case for Le Mans. Yes, um, your question, I guess, originally was why a charter school? Um, I, I think first off and, and, and most uh, is it's a school of choice. Um, so um, in our case, uh, as I think one misconception is that, um, that there's a fee associated with that, but it is a public school, which means it is tuition free. Um, I think that's a really important piece to that. The thing with um, a charter school that is uh, nice can be from the fact that you can tailor, so in our case, it's language immersion. Um, so we have a lot of our focus is that is driven that way. So um, that is one of the beautiful things about a charter school where you can really make it um, uh, really tailored where uh, sometimes I think larger school districts struggle with that because they have to serve um, an immense amount of, of, of folks across the board. So mm -hmm. it can be very and, focused. And, and I know that uh, uh, charter schools could be started by anybody, parents, organizations, corporations. Melissa, in your case, I, I believe that uh, Oklahoma Youth Academy Charter School is the first one started by the state of Oklahoma. And what was the reasoning behind starting your organization? So, yes, we are the only one in Oklahoma and honestly um, in the United States that is actually operated by a state agency. So, uh, my school is actually here facilities for our juveniles that have been sent to us in courts. So, uh, our, our school came into an existence because they just stepped back, they looked at it and said, can we provide something that might be a little bit more tailored to our population and yeah, really on a holistic? So we we honestly start for the first day of our program. So I think I think we might be having an audio issue. To be honest, I, I was uh, not able to hear the audio there real quick. Uh, my apologies uh, for that, uh, Melissa. So. Um, we know or have a better understanding of what a, a, a charter school is. Uh, Dean Ketchum, if we could uh, talk to you, and, and uh, you're you're the head of school, and your first name is Dean, so I, I, I was like, is it a title? Is it your first name? I remember when John Rex opened in 2014. It was like the coolest restaurant had come to town. Everybody wanted their child to go to John Rex. Could you tell me about uh, what John Rex is all about and how your location plays into the value you're providing families. So, and, and I miss that fanfare. I was, uh, I'm a native Oklahoman, but I was actually um, in New York City as an administrator during the time that John Rex opened. So I've come to the party a little bit late. Uh, I believe that, you know, um, the innovative foresight of business leaders and people who wanted this school downtown was to really provide a viable option and an urban corridor of Oklahoma City that is developing so fast, so quickly, and um, giving these kids a wonderful opportunity to explore downtown Oklahoma City and really access all the business community leaders and things there are to offer. And it continues to grow. So I think that was um, very enticing to families uh, in the metro area to want their kids to have a wildly different experience than maybe a suburban neighborhood school, but uh, something that was unique. All right, um, and, and uh, I, I had noted when I was actually doing uh, some research here um, that your mascot is uh, a rocket, you're the Rockets. But we are the a, Rockets. There's a philosophy behind that. Could you talk about that? Uh, that we're lifting off constantly and we're soaring to all kinds of heights. We're soaring to heights in academics. We're soaring to heights in exploring and community relationships and rigor. So I think it's a good metaphor for a school. Uh, you know, I've seen different schools with uh, birds flying in their library as lights and, uh, you know, this kind of thing of uh, lifting off. We just had an eighth grade graduation that we called lift off. Uh, because we think we're preparing you to uh, rock it into the future and to be a part of a community and a larger academic world. So uh, it makes sense to me. Terrific. 
Melissa, glad to have you back. There was there was an audio issue there. I don't know if it was a connection issue, but could we go back to your organization and uh, how it got started and the reason? Because yours, each one of these schools is a little bit different uh, in terms of their raison d'etre, the reason for existing. What What is yours? Okay, hopefully you can hear me. Oh, 100%. Okay, good. So our school um, came into existence in... Um, for the, for the fact that they were just really wanting to provide a holistic view towards um, our kids. So yes, we provide the Englishes, the math, the science, the social studies, but we also really look into the social emotional side of things, the therapy side of things, and then also um, just unification with the um, neighborhoods that they came from. So we really try to um, work on that planning as far as where are they gonna go? What school are they gonna go to? Do they wanna go back to school? Are we looking at a career tech, are we looking at college? Can we help them um, get a job when they leave? Help them get their driver's license, help them get birth certificates, just things that they So, um, you know, that's not what all public schools do. So when our, our state agency comes back and said, are we able to provide the education that these kids need that are tailored and individualized to each one of our kids' needs? But then also, how can we work towards uh, for the future and for you to get back to you know, the kids that they come from. Got it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And Loita, how did Le Monde get started? And by the way, I'm uh, I took two years of French. It's just enough to sound pretty silly. So <laughs> I probably said that wrong. But Le Monde, how did how did that get started? Um, well, we um, were birthed out of a program that, that um, really started was started by the uh, public school system and um, where I live. And um, uh, they were up and running for a few years doing a partial immersion um, piece and then decided um, almost overnight, um, at least to the parents from a parent perspective, that um, we're not going to continue this. And after seeing uh, what came of it and how kids were really flourishing, um, just basically said, no, we want to see this continue. Um, and so that was really kind of a turning point where um, just decided to dig our heels in and um, really start sh getting the shovels out, I guess, if you will, and um, seeing what it takes to really get one going. And so um very excited as as to where we are right now um, and growing uh, overnight, literally, um, where we have waiting lists for our, our students, people who want to come into our school. Uh, it's a very innovative program uh, with rigorous uh, education pieces attached to it. Basically, you use the language as the, the vehicle that you learn all of your coursework. So it works out well. Uh, there's a, lots and lots of studies out there uh, where it shows how your cognitive skills are opened up when you learn a language at a very young age. Mm -hmm. um, and what if a, a parent becomes aware of one of these schools, Melissa, for example, in your case, uh, are, are the kids, how, how do you define the, the kids that you work with? Because aren't, aren't many of them at risk? Are they in the system? How, do, how does that work? Yeah, so I'm a little bit different than the traditional charter school in that matter. Um, our kids are actually sent to us in, by a judge. So they're ordered their placement due to um, criminal activity. So it is a secure lockdown facility. So my kids actually live there. <laughs> they they don't leave until the uh, judge orders them to leave. Got it. But in, in Loida, in your case, uh, how, how do parents typically find out about Lamont or how do they discover, and Dean, this, this applies to you with John Rex, how do parents discover that, you know, this might be a good idea for my children? Well, for us, um, I it's open. The recently the, the laws have changed where um, anyone can come in. We've actually have students that come from uh, Oklahoma City all the way down to Norman. Um, we have students that come in from from um, the south side of of uh, of um, Norman down I thirty five off of Purcell from Purcell even. So we've got students that come in from all over. Um, but um, really, I think. 
parents, if they want to come and check it out, and that's what we, we encourage that. We want them to see what we offer um, and see if it will work for your child. And uh, and obviously, our goal is language immersion. So um, f- families know that going into that, that they're, the goal is to learn another language when they come out. So um, it's 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 a, a wonderful opportunity. I mean, we could have started a um, private school, but we wanted to have an opportunity for anybody to be able to uh, attend. And so um, the charter was a great option for that. All right. Dean, I imagine your waiting lists are still long. They, they are long and we continue though to use social media or a website. And um, unlike the immersion school she was speaking of, we're, we're only um, serving children in the Oklahoma City area. And um, yeah, the reputation was well built and branded before I came on board. And so that's a nice luxury. Um, And we still strive to look, though, to uh, make sure that people are knowledgeable about coming to the school, what the school has to offer and what it's going to be like uh, having your child um, in this urban corridor going to school and really accessing downtown Oklahoma City. It is quite a different experience than probably what they grew up going to school in Oklahoma um, as their own educational background. Could we talk about, and, and this is where we'll sort of get into the weeds a little bit, and sort of, I always love day in the life videos, but Dean, if you could talk about John Rex and what it's like for students, what does a student's day look like at John Rex? Some days it looks pretty traditional, other days not. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. When the Marriott Garden had the special flower that blooms once every hundred years or whatever, the corpse flower, um, you know, we're able to on the fly make uh, um, choices and watch. We had it all on video. So kids were able to access and walk over to the Marriott Gardens and see it and have a memorable experience they'll never forget. Um, but you know, typical day for our kids is they get dropped off by their parents. They come in, they grab their breakfast. Uh, we start our day. We have the same academic rigor. If it's a library day, though, we're accessing the downtown library and going over and checking out books. So there's a lot of wagon pulling and a lot of little ones out exploring this community constantly. And, you know, sometimes you do hear things uh, last minute or we have to keep a watch on. And we are able to transition quickly and make sure kids have access to that. And we're right here. So that's great. And Melissa, in your case, um, so a day in the life, I would imagine that it it's, might be a little more structured. What does a day in the life look like at your organization? It's very structured. <laughs> we have the day planned down to the minutes. Um, but yes, the, the kids typically get up, they go to breakfast, do hygiene, PT type stuff, come into our school. Um, we provide school for um, in the, the morning half, and then they uh, break at lunch. Um, due to population and, and, and how our cafeteria is set up, there's three different lunches. So when one group is in lunch, the other group is doing like a PE or a rec therapy type um, uh, treatment. <clears throat> there's also at that time where they're running um, individual groups, independent living, anger management, substance abuse, um, you know, whatever groups at that time, and then they come back and finish their day with us. And it, it's, it's a full day. We're also year round. So our kids uh, go to school every day year round. So we, we get a little bit of break in the summer, but it's, it's, it's year round. They get about a two week break. Um, and, and we do have a traditional calendar as far as like spring break, fall break, and, and you know, Christmas break, things like that. But yeah, we have it pretty much scheduled down to the minute until they go to sleep. <laughs> Is there, in terms of the uh, the classes, anything uh, that you could speak to in terms of innovations that help them once they leave and enter the workforce? Any particular courses or programs? Yeah, so <clears throat> most people are familiar with ICAP. ICAP is the Individual um, Career and Academic Planning. It was a state law that went into effect a couple years ago um, for uh, <clears throat> eighth grade students and on up. And so I think this year it's like sophomores. I don't know, but when when ICAP came about. I actually um, worked on that when I was at the State Department of Education. Excuse me, my voice is going out. And um, I just, I believe it. I believe in it. I buy in it. So um, we have courses. We do all the the planning as far as um, career and academic planning. We're we're doing um, classes that help with like uh, resume writing, interview skills, um, job applications. And like I said, you know, um, a lot of our kids actually come in and do not have 
birth certificates. They don't have their photo IDs. They don't have the things that they need to be able to go get a job. And so we do a lot of um, preparing for that type of stuff in a class. We also do um, what we call like an academic achievement class where we really try to fill in the gaps. Um, you know, we have the majority of our kids come in very far behind um, and they're not behind necessarily due to a learning disability. Um, some of them, yes, absolutely. I think we have about 50% of our population are identified on an IEP. Um, but honestly, uh, about 100% come behind and it's really just um, lack of um, instruction. Like they're not in school. They have been suspended. They've dropped out. They don't go. So we really try to fill in those gaps and try to um, increase their reading skills, their math skills to be able to go out and, um, you know, be a productive citizen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you talk about those uh, uh, math and science skills, Louita. I have to imagine, I'm going to ask the silliest question ever. Are your students like fluent in French or Spanish by the time they graduate? I mean, and, and I, I'm just curious about that. But, but beyond that, could you tell us about some of the programs that you have at Le Mans that are using French and Spanish? Is there something math related? I, I grew up in the era of the Saxon textbooks. I'm from Muskogee. So I remember those. So you would build upon each lesson, each math lesson with like stories. Uh, is there anything like that in terms of programs that involves French and Spanish uh, at Le Mans? Um, well, to your first question, do they are they all speaking um, fluently? Um, well, it's like learning English, you know, it just it takes time and it's over time. Um, um, the 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 goal is so they are i will tell you this so i have a fourth grader who speaks spanish and his spanish his enunciation is beautiful um i think that's half the battle um and just really learning um how to do that uh, a lot of focus obviously is on their their reading and writing in spanish right now um i have another um child who speaks french and um, i don't speak french but um um, I have other friends that do, and um, they have been um, very impressed with with his um, skills there for uh, just being in it just a few few years. So um, from that perspective, that's exciting. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the language uh, is just the, the, the vehicle that they use, um, but they do do programs. We use a lot of Flipgrid, um, some of those kind of programs where they can actually watch themselves um, um, practice their language. Um, for example, um, my one son in French, um, they had a class project where they had to um, show their house as if it was for sale. Um, and so, which was really great because then they had to use not only the language, but really make sure that they're honing in and they know the different rooms and the different items that are in the room that they had very pointed questions that they had to point out um, from that perspective. Um, we also do um, pen pals from other places, um, which is great. So that way they um, actually, one of my my sons who's in the program uh, was just telling me, he said, mom, I just got to meet my pen pal the other day. So um, it, there's a lot of real life application, obviously, when you're doing that. Um, we have been very blessed to have a very good relationship with the French embassy and, and French consulate. Um, they came out to visit, visit us this year um, and they have a, a pretty strong um, uh, effort that they put in for language uh, or sorry for um, teaching French in America. And um, so uh, we have a very small piece of that and it was so great to have them out and show them and showcase kind of what, what we're doing. So um, lots of different different uh, ways to do that. We have teachers from 11 different countries. Um, so they bring in a lot of that as well um, on their own, uh, just from their own culture. So if you're just joining us, I, I wasn't just joining, I was just backstage lurking. So if you're just now joining us, Beyond the Bell, we're episode six, so brought to you by Oklahoma, uh, um, uh, Every Kid Counts, Oklahoma. And we have, uh, by the way, just, you know, this is what happens on Saturday morning, Ryan, if you get your own name. Dean Ketchum, Loida Salmond, Melissa White. And I'm struck by, Ryan, the differences, complete differences in missions. Okay, so I look at what Dean Ketchum was doing. And I noticed Dean Ketchum and Melissa White 
your SDE veterans, okay, mm-hmm. having both served over there, and Dean Ketchum over there, uh, Executive Director of Innovation and Improvement. Uh, and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions on that, if you don't mind. And Loita's program, uh, Language Immersion, and Melissa's. You, Melissa, yours was the first charter school in Oklahoma, if I recall correctly. No, <clears throat> no, no, we were the first in, uh, well, Oklahoma, but also the United States that was operated by a state agency. Got it. So we, Which is Oklahoma Youth Services, correct? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Office of Juvenile Affairs. I'm close to, you know, at, at some point, you know, if you're in it's within the, the same circle. Difference. Right. So <laughs> totally different. Hey, Dean, <laughs> when you were over there working on improvement uh, at the SDE and you see what's happening here, you look at this panel and it's such di- such difference. And, you know, legislative intent this year was to try to do a lot of uh, workforce development. Uh, also, you know, we've had nurse shortages, things of this nature. When you see what charters are doing, as well as public, as well as private, when you are working on improvement of uh, our education system in Oklahoma, do you like the direction we're going, especially when you look at the charter programs and, and things that public schools, by the way, our first episode we had, uh, was it Ada, Ryan, that was doing the air, uh, avionics program? 100%. Uh, Ada High School. It's pretty incredible, Dean. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I love to see states growing. One of the compelling reasons as I come back to Oklahoma City especially is I think it's a city on the move. It's always improving. You can tell just by what's going on around you. Uh, this panel makes me very excited. I think healthy competition with schools and different choices. Choice is always a good thing uh, for kids, for parents, for community conversation, for keeping a keeping it, it moving in the right direction, asking the right questions, making improvements. Mm-hmm. Melissa struck me too. There's so many similarities, even though we're, we're different, that, um, you know, we have a diverse community and our academic goal is as kids transition and families make choices or move out of our area, et cetera, we want them prepared for the transition. We want them as prepared as possible for life, for academics in any setting. And then as Lloyda was talking about being innovative and all the things coming in, just brought back a memory of my fourth graders doing an engineering and design project. And they built boats out of limited materials, mostly cardboard and um, timed them to see who was going to win down at the uh, river sport to see how long they floated. But, you know, we have a uh, time in our schedule for creative and compelling things moving forward. I have to say, I was at the state department in as director of school improvement with a lot of great people, but I was there during um, no child left behind when schools around the state were getting lots and lots of new policy and lots of information coming out and moving kids forward to have all kids really strive towards proficiency. And I know we all look at growth. We want to see growth with new families coming in, changing populations. And so we want growth and proficiency, but that growth metric is very important as kids transition through life and move on. And I think that's what Melissa was talking about. So, um, yeah, I think the answer to your question is sitting in front of you that these are all compelling choices for families that are looking for something different, challenging, um, or a need. And so being available to those families and knowing how many people are on those wait lists and who is looking is reason certainly um, to be thinking forward. And I've spent time in traditional public uh, brick and mortars and in real urban areas. As I said, I was an administrator in New York City. Um, You know, those when you're in a school of choice in New York City and there are four other neighborhood schools in the same area and you're friends with those administrators and you collaborate and work, that competition and sharing of practice uh, just makes your program better. It makes you look forward for how you're really serving your community. And I think that's what we should all be striving to do. Hey, Dean, we have to ask you, because Ryan will want to know, I'll have to get to the question first. Is it Yankees or Mets, Giants or Jets? Oh, you know, I hate to say this. I'm an OU guy, so that's my big winner. And then I root for the Mets and the Jets. I just, I I, I have to root for the underdog all the time. Okay, I, totally, Mets and Jets totally fans are different, yeah. Yeah. Totally appreciate that. Hey, uh, Lloyd, I, I've got a question. I know that one of the things you work on is critical thinking. And I think a lot of people, simple people like me go immersive language. Why? And I, I read on your mission. It's like critical thinking. 
you know, it, it, making that better for students to critical think. So how do you arrive at French and Spanish as opposed to, say, German or um, uh, Asian language, for example? Well, um, some of it, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the school, when we first started, it was a French immersion program that was um, uh, closed down um, through the regular public school. So we wanted to see that continue. So that is um, French. Um, and actually, um, French is a pretty common language, I would say, around the world. Um, so it's there's you will find that people that are speaking a lot of different dialects, usually um, it's either English, Spanish, or French are the common ones that if they are trying to collaborate and think together, um, those are the ones that are, are there. So um, that's why French, um, Spanish, I think um, is just, we have a lot of Spanish speakers um, throughout the country. Um, and so that just made sense as well. So someday um, we may look to also uh, add more to it. So um, I would love to do that. So that's, that's where we're at. Is it possible you'll be doing any demonstrations of French cooking? You never know. I mean, I we could definitely do that. Um, we got do judges, it people sometimes. that would volunteer to judge. You know, just Ooh, I like butter. that idea. We actually just had an international food festival uh, last week, but I really like that idea. I'm going to take that one back. Okay, there's so much Julia Child right now, and so you could just you know just dovetail off of that. Well, Scott, Scott, you bring bring up a good point, and Melissa, I'll ask you this: in terms of like life skills, are are there for any of these schools, John Rex Lamont? or OIA, uh, or what What sort of life skills, you know, you often hear uh, people of my generation, Gen X, say, oh, I sure wish I would have learned how to balance a checkbook, not that anybody's doing checkbooks anymore, things like that. What are some of the life skills that are happening uh, at OIA? I, I'm going to jump in just because I want to comment on her immersion school and then on life skills. Uh, you know, immersion schools are popular all over the country, but as we talk about choice and charters, I think it's a perfect example to say it's not for everyone, but it's very compelling for a lot of people. So there, there's a need for that choice. I always think of life skills as um, if you've got a really great program and you're teaching good academics, you're teaching life skills. Mm -hmm. And then um, just having kids in person is so important. And we've strived really hard through the pandemic to have kids in person as much as possible. And I'm really proud of that. But um, just getting them here and socializing, going through daily routines, figuring it out, helping them reason, increasing their cognitive development. But, you know, all of those academics really are life skills that help them plug in for bigger questions that come up later in their life once they're through with elementary school, for sure. Yeah, and I would say, so there's different, I think, facets to look at. So we, we as an A, so you have our program itself where the kids live and stay that has an accreditation process just like our school does. And through that accreditation, they're required to offer, you know, life skills, independent living, things like that. So our kids are learning how to use the, the dishwasher, the, the washer and the dryer, how to iron, how to balance a checkbook, how to um, understand stocks and bonds, how to understand retirement, how to understand interest rate and how credit cards are the devil and don't get them and, you know, all those things. So that stuff is going on through our facility, which we also look at and, and add to. Um, and so, I mean, I, I think our, our program probably takes life skills to a little bit different level than most, because like I said, our kids are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we work with our actual superintendent of the, 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 the facility as well. And so we have a awesome relationship. Um, we work together, we, we plan together, we look at the, the things, talk about, we go to meetings, we staff every single kid, um, go through their academic gains, their, their therapy gains, their, you know, what are, what are the, the things that we need to work on? Um, but I think for my kids, some of the most important life skills are built through the relationships with our teacher. Um, I have some of the best teachers in the state, hands down. Um, it takes so much patience, <laughs> So much understanding to understand that, um, you know, our kids aren't bad kids. They've just made some kind of bad decisions, bad choices. Um, and to understand that um, a lot of these kids have been faced with all kinds of traumas, um, you know, living in poverty, mental health, substance abuse issues, um, 
you know, a different, a different life than most of us are accustomed to or, or want to think, I think sometimes exist. Um, and so just to have that patient and that understanding and to know that, you know, our kids lose their temper every once in a while. They say things they shouldn't say every once in a while. They do things they're not, but um, just to have that understanding of patience and we really just work with them. And I feel like that's a life skill is just basically mentoring and, and, you know, um, guiding them through when you're angry. These are things that doesn't work in the real world. Like you can't freak out like that and at your job or, you know, like just having that relationship and, and working through those problems with them and, and letting them see that they're in their eyes is, you know, like I said, it's a different world that we might not want to know exists, but there's a different world for them that they didn't know existed too. So, you know, to, to just be that positive, that positive role model to them is I think a, a huge life skill, but we do have that traditional, what we call life skills that they, they all go to for so many hours a week and, and learn the basics of, of life. I have to agree with Melissa. The, the most important thing she said is having a great staff and we have great teachers as well. I'm sure we all feel that way. But those relationships, relationships are key for kids in the community. And if you really have those with the right expectations and that great staff, yeah, things fall into place much more easily. And we're lucky to have that here in spades at John Rex. Socialization seems to be the ultimate life skill. It's, yeah. it's the one, you know, building relationships. You could be the most talented accountant in the world, but if you can't work cooperatively with your peers, it's it's uh, pretty impossible. Does that resonate with you, Loida? Absolutely. Um, I, you know, you guys have all talked about different um, teachers and the influences that they have, um, and it is so, so true. Um, it's really neat to see kids who are ready to get up every day and learn and they're excited about that um and that all starts with the teachers at the school um they they create that environment and we feel very blessed um as well to have uh teachers who who bring that every day day in and day out so absolutely i will say too that you know a good thing of being a charter is once i work so hard or i go through a lottery or i do my application and jump through a few hoops that engagement and excitement in the family and so proud and wanting to be there that carries over to start that that level of engagement and building that relationship it seems to me it is a catalyst for just to go a little more quickly and that support and the expectations from the family of knowing what they're walking into they can read the policy they know what they're going to get um, they've set their kids up for that. Like kids are very excited about showing up at, at John Rex every single morning. They're proud of it. And, and that comes from the families and that desire to make the choice. Yeah, absolutely. I would say that my kids aren't always excited to show up. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But honestly, at the end of the day, like I, I, I will invite you guys to come to a graduation because we have graduations whenever the kids graduate. It, we could have 25 a year. We could have one every day of the year. I don't care. We have them when they graduate and we celebrate them. Um, but I would say 95% of my kids stand up there and say, this was never a dream of mine. This was never a, a thought of mine. I never thought that I would ever graduate high school. I never thought that I could, you know, and so just for them to accomplish and see that, you know, that's, it's a doable thing. Like it's really honestly um, rewarding. Um, you know, most of my kids don't value education. They never did. They didn't, you know, um, they, they struggled. They were the kids that, I mean, quite frankly, got, you know, suspended and kicked out and were on the streets. And, you know, so um, to know that there are, you know, people out there that want them to do good and, and care. So, yeah, it's, I just had to, to, to say that my kids are always 100% excited about coming, but, but they come. It's uh, it's no kidding. It, when you watch what goes just economically right now mm -hmm. about how many people don't have those simple life skills. And Melissa, I really appreciate the credit cards are the devil on the economic show. Yeah. But you cannot, people have to strive to do the fundamentals every single day, no matter if it's education or you're a head coach in the National Football League. I recall and Ryan gets tired of me telling the story about that old movie, Bull Durham, where they're trying to bring this kid up as a good baseball player. And the manager says, you know, baseball's an easy game. Mm -hmm. You catch the ball, you hit the ball, 
and you throw the ball. And it's so many of these things are based upon the fundamentals. If you forget the fundamentals, how many books have been written? How many self-help books, how many planning books have been written about? You've got to understand the fundamentals and these lives that you're helping really with these guideposts, Melissa, with that sort of background, it, it, it's actually, it's thrilling to me to yeah. hear that. And, and we say across the board here today, these different skill levels that people, uh, that young people can get to, it's just thrilling. Okay. Mm -hmm. And giving people a chance, a difference between successful life, depending on what your definition of success is. And one that's not a lot has to do with the mentoring that they've had, the guidance that they've had from somebody older, the education they've gotten, but Melissa back to yours. Okay. Nobody's going to ever, uh, can, uh, confuse your program with a Harvard MBA, right? <laughs> but there's going to be people that will come out of your program, understanding fundamentals that will do better than people coming out of Harvard MBA programs. Just that's yeah. the fact, right? Yeah. I think it's marvelous. I, if I could just take a, a moment, um, start with you, Melissa, and then Lloyda and then Dean, just take a moment. Um, people want to know more about your program or if they want to, to help your programs in your case, Melissa, uh, legislators, whatever, or that, maybe need to come see your program. You've hit on a point, which is come see the graduation, come see these lives and how this, uh, how the things that they're doing are impacting people. So if yeah. we just kind of go around the panel, just kind of wrap up with what, what else we might need to know and how to find you. For sure. So um, again, I'm, I'm housed out of the office of juvenile affairs. And so um, my email, you can find me on our website, Google, I'm sure. Um, contact me. I'll be more than happy to, to get you through. As far as legislation, I would say that we have been very, very blessed um, as far as um, asking and getting support for a lot of things through our school. Um, actually, we just got a bill passed like this, this session that allows us to expand our charter school outside of our walls. So if we have a student, because it is judge ordered, so we, we could say we think this kid is probably going to leave in about June, but they go to court in January and they're doing great, the, the judge might say, You're, you can go home. And he might have literally a half credit left. And so, um, and, and the likelihood of our kids going back into their public school is honestly very slim. We don't, we don't have a lot that, that go back and are successful in that, in that matter. Um, they, they face a lot of barriers when they're going back to their schools and a reputation and a, a, a past that they um, have to, you know, try to get past to. And so, and, and my kids are older. Most of my kids are older kids. So um, this allows us to provide our charter school outside those. So if we have a kid that is close to graduating or, or we feel has the discipline to be able to, you know, log on every day and, and work on their program, then they can still continue through Oklahoma Youth Academy once they're back in their home environment. Um, so that's something that, you know, we're going to have to individually, individually look at because honestly, an online program at home for an 18 year old kid is, is a difficult program. It takes a lot of self-discipline. It takes a lot of um, maturity and, and want to, to be able to do that. So it is something that we're, you know, we have to look at very individually individualized to see if that's something. But as far as legislation, we've been very blessed. Um, the Office of Juvenile Affairs um, honestly um, helps fund. I mean, we obviously get state funding from the State Department of Ed, but if my kids need something, OJA gets it for them. Um, I have an amazing board. I mean, honestly, I, I have a board full of, honestly, educators, which is crazy um, because it's the Office of Ju Juvenile Affairs board, but um, there's several educators on there and they get it. So we ask and 99% of the time they make it happen for us. So I, I have a lot of support through my board. Um, my director, Rachel Holt, she is amazing. She's an advocate. Um, she she gets she gets things done. So um Luckily, I'm very fortunate when it comes to that, that, that end of things. Um, but yes, for sure. If anybody, you know, wants to ever come out, you have, did you go through a little bit of a background to get in and, you know, get, go through metal detector and all that kind of fun stuff, but I'll get you through and, and I'll be more than happy for you guys to come and, and experience because it honestly, like, I'm not that much of an emotional person, but I tell you what, those graduations, 99% of the time you see tears coming because you're just so proud and it's just, it's honestly moving and it's rewarding. Uh, by the way, I would say, you know, the, the, um, Holt family is a great family a power couple, but only a power couple because of Mrs. Holt. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's what it boils right down to the most important, powerful person in that household is the director of office of juvenile affairs. And she's a rock star. 
<laughs> and by the way, I mean, I just let me just uh, take a moment here. You've got the chair, Karen Youngblood, a longtime friend, passionate person, Stephen, Dr. Stephen Grissom, Dr. Mantra Jones, who's now the first um, minority president. I think I know it's OCCC. We had her on a hot seat, Ryan, about two months ago. Okay. An incredible, another rock star. Um, the Honorable Janet Foss, Jenna Worthen, Dr. Amy Emerson, Timothy Tartabono, who's doing all that great work down in Oklahoma County. Uh, working to bring forward a, a facility that we can treat mental health issues and stuff for the next jail population. By the way, that's June the 28th, that big bond issue. Uh, uh, Dr. Sidney Ellington and Dr. Bartlett, ba or Bartlett Bouse. I just thought, Melissa, I should name them when you brought them up, that these are people doing a really, really yeah, great job. For sure. Loita, anything that uh, else we need to know about your fascinating program? Um, I, one thing I will just start off and say, one thing I is sitting on this panel today and listening to everyone else. Um, it's, it's very exciting. I think the future is bright. Um, you know, opening doors for kids and giving them the avenue that fits best for their needs is so, so important. We can't put kids in a cookie cutter um, uh, box. And um, I love hearing about this, um, all the things that Melissa is doing to get you know, students to be in a, in a place where they can um, be ready to thrive. And then Dean and, and, and what he's doing there, um, being in a, a really neat environment, cool urban environment where you can do all kinds of things there um, is really exciting um, for us um, at Le Monde International School. Um, you know, I think there are doors that can be open when you know a another language. The world is becoming a smaller place. Um, I mean, we're all sitting here probably in different parts of, of Oklahoma um, uh, and, uh, and and we're making it happen. So um, as you start looking at the world and, and how it is becoming a smaller place, um, sure, you can use translators and these and, and things like that. But if you can speak um, another person's language, um, it you you open more doors and that relatability is so much greater um and so, so i am super excited to see where some of these for their language skills work could potentially take kids um we are a school that um as i as i said um it is a tuition free school as all the charter schools are um and um we right now we are growing by one grade every year um and so right right now we are through fourth grade in Spanish next year it'll be through fifth grade um, and then um, same thing in French so we go this year pre-k through seventh grade next year will be eighth grade so really excited about that we are also a school that is um, working hard to become an international baccalaureate school um, and so um, that's one thing that we wanted to going back to really setting um, our kids at a level uh, where they can function um, very, very well at a high level, both in English as well as another language. Um, and a lot of the pieces that align with an, an IB school, which is the International Baccalaureate School, um, are things that we want automatically um, for our, our school. And so it was really a great opportunity for us to um, put our position, uh, put ourselves in a position where we can um, hone on, hone in on that program, and 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 work towards that. It's right now we're what we're considered a candidate school. So, it takes you a few years to get through that program, but that's that's where we are. So, um, French and Spanish, those are the two tracks, and the parents get to choose along with their kids uh, what works best, and um, um, looking to always find ways to be innovative and provide a lot of good opportunity for for our students. So. It's a magnificent, magnificent program. And uh, last, Dean Ketchum, who earlier correctly answered the question, the answer were Jets and Mets. <laughs> and I have to tell you that I don't have it hung. This is a new studio we're outfitting right now. We're right above, let's see, my, you might just see the 12 above my shoulder yes, there. Okay. I see it. That is my assigned Joe Willie. The other thing is I saw uh, the last year at Shea Stadium, I got to know Jets fans because there was, I'm a Packers shareholder, okay? Okay. There was a expatriate Packer that played for the Jets for one season. You may recall that. So I saw him a couple of times that year. And I think Jets, Mets fans, are the, they're the hoot. 
okay? The, the coolest kids are Jets Mets fans. Yeah, I, I think one of my uh, memorable experiences was going to the last playoff game for the Mets, even though they didn't make it that year. It was an experience like none other. And I'll bring that up. I'll first say thank you very much, this panel. It's nice to be collaborative and share space and time with people. I think what Melissa said also, you know, having a very supportive and um, collaborative board helping you move things forward. Uh, I bring up the Mets story since you opened that door. Um, you know, I, I want memorable experiences for these children. I want the innovation to continue. I also want traditions to exist, don't we all? We want them to come back. We want them to be proud of where they came from and to give back. We want more community partners. We we're all looking for either, um, you know, volunteers, financial resources. We want to expand our community, uh, especially as my area continues to grow and we have new families moving in. We want this to be as vibrant of a city as possible. And we want to be that shining star downtown. That's another draw for people to come in. But I do think that engagement and relationships and providing kids and community and parents a memorable experience that they'll never forget. Uh, I think that's really important. And I hope kids have more and more like I've had and they want to explore the world and they have languages to support them and they have skills, life skills, academic skills. We want them to be rockets. We want them to soar through not only the Oklahoma City and Oklahoma community, but in the world beyond and make a difference. We want to hear about them later. Um, so I think our goal is to continue to push to provide things that, um, especially high rigorous academics and relationships that are going to make them confident young people that will uh, traverse their next steps in life with um, not ease, but uh, with confidence and success. Mm -hmm. Well, you have wonderful programs. Thanks for taking us. Thanks for uh, Louita, thanks for immersing us in these programs. So I kind of like that one. And I think that, you know, people, it's so much easier for people to be critical about people that are really breaking down barriers. I think of that Domingo Santiago quote, I believe that was his name. It was about bullfight critics and it was row after row of bullfight critics crowd the Plaza de Toro, but only one knows. And he's the one who fights the bull. Okay. So the, the fact is, is when you're really stretching the limits and you're going into these areas, which are, are, you know, this is pioneering work. And it, it also sounds like it's pioneering work that's succeeding. And want to thank our panel today for this. It's a, it, today's been an education is I know I can speak for Ryan on this. Every one of these we've done six now have been incredible learning experiences for us. And we're hoping that the audience is, is learning as well too. It also makes it easier for us to be just to step back and be kind and appreciate what people are doing to help others. Mm -hmm. That is a lost art in our society right now. And you folks are really succeeding. So thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. So there goes our panel. Uh, that was great. By the way, really enjoyed your lines of questions in terms of really getting down uh, granular as to what they're doing. It's incredible. And you start to see, or you, when you first look at it, like, like the immersive language, I know I've asked myself why a hundred times, I just don't get it. I get it now. Totally get it. And the, uh, um, example of the, uh, real estate listing makes sense. You have to identify the rooms, the things that are in the rooms, you have to put together your advertising. Um, I actually always quite liked the Saxon method of teaching math. And I, it was actually very controversial in the 80s and 90s. It was uh, very controversial. But it, it was because of uh, the storylines and the real world examples uh, that I was able to get through higher forms of, of high school math. And so I think it's, it's useful. As my uh, late great mother used to say, her favorite word was options. And these were, again, three different options. We've had six weeks of innovators, um, whether it be public, private, charter school. We had two weeks on um, aviation education in Oklahoma. There's so much exciting that is going on in the state. And it's kind of cool to think we have a three-month break, but we're going to be back in the fall doing this again. I'm uh, looking forward to it. 
And by the way, pretty busy weekend for Griffin Communications because of that. Uh, there's this little uh, putt putt going on right up in Tulsa. Yeah, you bet. You bet. There is a guy named Tiger still in the running. So he's did he make the cut? I, it was just one Okay. You bet. You bet. You bet. Uh, we've uh, uh, had a, a couple of fantastic days of coverage, and it started again early this morning. I don't know who the leader is precisely this moment, but it's been a, a great event, not only for the city of Tulsa, but for the entire state of Oklahoma. So you can go check that out. Go check out this morning's hot seat, which will be on uh, news9.com soon. I think that was for people that were wondering what the heck was happening this week at the legislature. Uh, a lot of people in the, uh, in that building are playing nice this week, but make no mistake. That was a, there were reverberations on that situation with that, uh, those billions of dollars in ARPA money. It was moving too slow. Mm -hmm. The legislature decided to take charge. They did. Um, everybody's playing nice, but what, uh, Kyle Hilbert said this morning to give you some idea at the rate, this thing was dragging along over the next year of the ARPA money the state has, we could have lost $150 million because of the big I word, okay, which is eating right. into that. The, the, and, the real world impact of inflation. Exactly. And I want to pitch one thing that's you didn't know this was coming. Carl Torp did a story that I saw yesterday. I think it was in the six o'clock. Mm -hmm. Okay. With his folks. So I wondered about the Torp name, Scandinavian, right? You bet Norwegian. Okay. So didn't know about, so it, it's one of the great stories. Go to news9.com and see that story. It's just heartwarming. And I loved it. It was like a movie trailer. I enjoyed it so right. much, Ryan. Right. It actually, I, I, I think it, uh, man, it could have been sort of a, a, a documentary looking for Victor. Really great. Really, really great. Okay. Well, it's, uh, the air conditioner is not running 24 seven right now at my house. I hope it's not at yours. And I really do appreciate your time on this, this program beyond the bell. We'll be back in the fall. You bet brought to you by every kid counts, Oklahoma. And I think that you should uh, keep on tuning in about Saturday mornings at 10 AM for a while, because we've got quite a bit happening in June and election year. I think we'll be doing some announcements on that soon, but there's just, we're, we've had so much fun getting into the digital arena and basically it's, you know, we kind of feel like we're out here by ourselves. We do so much of this, but so many people say to us, thanks for letting and putting a space out there where you can get into these things in a granular method, like it, dislike it. It's still out there for the um, marketplace of ideas. Yeah. It's, it's available to, to them anytime. And, and by the way, if you happen to be watching this on the KWTV or the KOTV Facebook page, take a second and go over to Mitchell talks. This is where this originates. Facebook.com slash Mitchell talks on Twitter at Mitchell talks on LinkedIn, Mitchell talks. Um, that, that way you'll hear about it first. You'll see it live maybe on KW or KO, but you'll hear about it first on Scott's pages. Well, thank you very much. Well, thanks to uh, uh, Every Good Counts Oklahoma. Thanks to Griffin Communications and, of course, Ryan Welton for everything you do. And thanks to you, the folks who tune into this continually across our platforms. We've got already have a really good stream lined up for Monday night. We think we'll be breaking some news. I've got more on that later. But in the meantime, have a great weekend, everybody.